Welcome to the second season of Murder 20 Podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes. We're getting into the spirit of summer and taking a short two-week break. This week, we are featuring one of our most intriguing and popular true crime episodes. Anna Lee Welty was born April 4, 1943 in Texas and was one of four children. Her mother passed away when she was just a toddler and she went to live with her grandparents. Later, her father remarried and she went to live with him and his new wife. But when Anna was 14, they sent her to a reform school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She stayed a year before running away to Roswell. Anna was 5'7 with brown hair and hazel eyes. She changed her first name to Judy and in 1961, at age 19, had her first son, Arthur Michael Schultz. Judy and the baby's father never married, and Michael, who went by his middle name, had mental and physical disabilities. The Pensacola News Journal reported that a year later she met James Goodyear, a career military man. They married on January 21, 1962. James adopted Michael, and the couple had two more children, a boy and a girl. James Jr. was born in 1966 and Kimberly in 1967. That same year, the family of five moved to Orlando, Florida. There, Judy ran a daycare. Constant Lang was the family's live-in housekeeper, and one of her job duties included taking Michael out of the house whenever they had people visit. The two drove around the city for hours. At some point, Judy sent Michael to live in various institutions for the emotionally disturbed. Constance was having marital issues of her own when Judy confided in her that she and James had grown apart. Judy would casually mention that women could solve their problems by poisoning their husbands. But it was just a joke, right? Then one day, Judy brought it up again and suggested arsenic could be put into food or a drink. In 1970, James went to Vietnam and returned home the following year. He arrived home healthy, but several months later, he was exhausted and weak. Then he got a fever. His muscles ached, had abdominal pain. Then he got lightheaded and nauseous. After two weeks, he checked himself into the hospital at the Naval Air Station in Orlando. Three days later, on September 15, 1971, James was dead at 37. Judy collected $33,000 in life insurance and another $62,000 in veterans' compensation. Four months after losing her husband, Judy suffered another loss, when her house burned to the ground with everything in it. Someone had poured kerosene throughout the house and lit a match. Judy received $90,000 in insurance money. Judy Goodyear started using the name Judy S. Bueno Ono. She still used Judy for short, and the last name she claimed was a Spanish version of Goodyear. Fires would follow Judy two more times. Once in July 1976, a fire started in a closet in her home. Then... Not even a year later, another fire appeared to have started in an electrical outlet. For the two fires, she collected almost $60,000 from insurance. After James died, Judy met Bobby Morris. She told him her husband had died in a plane crash in Vietnam. The two moved in together and operated a maid service and a contracting business. Colorado permits common law marriages and she now went by the name Judy Morris. Friends recall Judy's behavior during this time as erratic with anger issues. While in Colorado, she became a licensed practical nurse. A former friend of Judy's, Mary Owens, met her soon after she moved in with Bobby. 
She would later recall a conversation that ended their short friendship. The two were in a grocery store in Pensacola, and Mary had just had an argument with her husband, and Judy suggested she kill him with poison, and that she could buy it at the grocery store. Flybait had arsenic in it. Then she told out Mary to take out more life insurance. Now Mary was mad at her husband, but she wasn't about to kill him. She'd seen a darker side of Judy and didn't like it. Bobby's mother Lodell met Judy and would also have an odd recollection of what she told her about James. That he'd been no good and wasn't any help and that he didn't deserve to live, so she killed him. The Pensacola News reported that Bobby accepted a new job and moved to Colorado to get away from Judy. He told his sister that she was manipulative and that she would kill him before she would let him go. But to his surprise, Judy and her three children followed Bobby and moved in with him. In January 1978, Bobby became severely ill, with chest pain and back pain, and became nauseous. The next day, he checked in to a hospital, the same hospital where Judy worked. She would bring him punch to drink, but he would turn it away. Two weeks later, he felt well enough to go home. Within two days, he was feeling ill again, and within a week, he was dead. Judy would later tell people that he had died from alcoholism. The New York Daily News reported that Judy collected $23,000 in life insurance, plus Bobby's home in which the mortgage had been paid off by insurance. That summer, she moved back to Pensacola and bought a home near the water in an expensive neighborhood called Gulf Breeze and consoled her grief with the new Lincoln Continental. Again, she changed her name by adding doctor to it. Michael lived in institutions until he was 14. Then he returned to the family home. He graduated from public high school and enlisted and became an army private. His military photo portrays a proud man with a strong jaw and deep eyes wearing dark frame glasses. On July 4, 1979, Michael wrote home to his mom. In his letter, he says... Mom, graduation day is August 3rd, and would you please come? He asked her to bring the camera and lots of film, and he ended it with, Mom, I love the Army. A few months later, Michael was on leave and went home to visit his family. While there, he developed intestinal issues and was in severe pain and went to the hospital. Military doctors ran tests on Michael, and found he had unexplained high levels of arsenic in his body. He survived, but it had destroyed his muscles. They'd atrophied, and his arms and legs no longer worked. He was discharged from the Army and spent months at the Tampa Hospital for Rehabilitation. On the afternoon of Monday, May 12, 1980, Judy picked up Michael from the hospital. The next afternoon, she loaded Michael, who was now 19, James Jr. 14, and Kimberler 13 into her car for a drive to nearby Milton to take Michael river fishing. It was the first time in four months Michael had been out of the hospital, and he was excited. They didn't have any life jackets, so instead, Judy wrapped a ski belt around Michael, and with 15 pounds of braces on his legs and right arm, she and James Jr. helped him into the canoe where a lawn chair had been placed in the center for him. Kimberly stayed on shore and watched her family drift down the river. They floated around a bend and out of sight. Then around 3 p.m., something happened. Judy would tell three versions of the tragic day, all slightly different. One was that Michael's fishing line had got snagged on a tree, Second was that a snake dropped out of a tree and into the canoe, startling them. And third was that they'd hit a submerged object. The truth probably lies somewhere in between. The end result was the same. The canoe flipped over and all three ended up in the water. When Judy surfaced, she spotted James Jr. face down. She swam to him and got him breathing. 
Then she looked around for Michael, but didn't see him. The weight of the braces pulled Michael under. His lifeless body landed on the bottom of the riverbed. Ricky Hicks was also fishing on the river that day. He came across Judy and James Jr. swimming downstream and pulled them out of the water. He offered to search for Michael, but Judy told him there was no point. He took the two to shore where they met up with Kimberly. She didn't even ask about Michael, and Ricky thought that was odd. Then Judy did something even odder. Before he had a chance to go get help, she asked him for a beer. In fact, she insisted on it. He handed her one, and she sat there and drank it. James Jr. was taken to the hospital and treated for minor injuries and released. The Santa Rosa search and rescue team searched the river for Michael. His body was found at 7 p.m. that night. Judy collected $109,000 for Michael's death from five different insurance policies. To help console herself, she purchased a new Corvette. She later told family members that Michael had died from poison gas used during his service in the military. John Gentry had a wallpaper business in Pensacola. In the summer of 1980, he met Judy at a mud wrestling match. The two started dating and he found her very kind and sweet. The South Florida Sun Sentinel reported that she told him she had a doctorate in psychology and physics and was head of a nursing at a local hospital. In September, Judy took out a business license for a beauty salon called Fingers and Faces, where she offered services in eyebrow waxing and nail sculpting. Six months later, John moved in with Judy and her two teenagers. Eventually, the couple became engaged. All the while, Judy was planning John's demise. She took out life insurance on him, and this time upped the amount to $510,000. She purchased a bottle of Vicon C, a combination of B vitamins. She removed the lid and carefully opened up the capsules and measured a precise dose of paraformaldehyde into each capsule, then put the capsules back together. In December of 1982, John came down with a cold, and Judy, the caring nurse, recommended he take Vicon C. Court records indicated that Judy kept the bottle of vitamins by the bed, and every night she handed John two capsules. But instead of helping him feel better, he felt worse. So Judy then suggested he double the dosage, and again he felt worse. So bad, he got nauseous and started having convulsions. John checked himself into the hospital, and after two weeks, he felt much better and returned home. Judy again suggested he take the vitamins, so he took two. Then he immediately experienced convulsions and vomited. The next day, he didn't take any and noticed he didn't get sick, so he refused to take any more, and that made Judy angry. John quietly tucked two of the capsules into his briefcase. Six months later, in May 1983, Judy told a couple women at her beauty salon that she was planning on a round-the-world cruise and would be taking the shop manager. When the women asked if she was taking John, she said no, that he was dying of cancer, which seemed odd because they had set a wedding date for June 28th. When the poison didn't work on John, Judy knew she had to come up with another plan. She called a friend of hers in Alabama who had access to dynamite. She enlisted her son to help her plant a bomb. Judy arranged a party at a local restaurant downtown for a friend who was also getting married. On Saturday, June 25th, she arranged for her and John to take separate vehicles to the dinner and she gave him precise instructions as to what time to arrive and where to park. And that morning, John had given James Jr. his trunk keys so that he could wire in his stereo. That evening, John arrived at 8 p.m. and parked where Judy told him. Then James Jr. used his key to open the trunk and place the bomb behind the rear seat on the driver's side and wired into the driver's side tail light. At 10.30 p.m., John left the restaurant, opened the driver's door, 
sat in the seat and turned the ignition key. The headlights and taillights came on, then a thundering boom, a blast so loud it was heard six blocks away. John managed to stumble out of the car and into the parking lot. The ambulance arrived and took him to the hospital. He had suffered severe damage to his intestines, kidney, liver, and stomach. John was 37 and would live to see another day. During their investigation of the car bomb, investigators discovered the half a million dollar life insurance Judy had taken out on John. They asked him if he'd been sick, and he replied that yes, he had. And he told them about his cold and Vicon C that Judy had given him. This got investigators' attention. Then they were stunned to learn that he had tucked away two of the capsules. He turned them over to investigators, and they were sent to an FBI lab. The test results came back, paraformaldehyde. Investigators interviewed friends and acquaintances of Judy's and discovered that her husband had died, her boyfriend had died, and recently her son had died. Death of her loved ones seemed to follow Judy. Police now opened up new investigations into the deaths of Michael, Bobby, and James. Investigators were starting to piece together what some had already suspected. This wasn't Judy's first murder attempt. In fact, she had become a serial killer. Approximate 10% of murders are committed by women, but that jumps to 15% for women serial killers. Women's motives differ from men. They kill for profit and power and tend to kill those closest to them. They fly under the radar with silent methods like drugs or poison, and because of this, they often operate far longer than their male counterparts. Judy fits his profile to a T. On Wednesday, July 27, Pensacola police arrested Judy for the attempted murder of John. They picked her up in the beauty salon and took her to the department for questioning. Her bond was set at $50,000, and by 7 p.m., she was bailed out by a bondsman. A search warrant was issued for Judy's home. There, in a closet, they found wire, wire that was highly unusual, and a perfect match to the wire used in the car bomb. They also arrested James Jr. In January 1984, Judy was indicted for the murder of Michael and grand theft for insurance fraud. Two months later, her trial for murdering her son began. Eight men and four women formed the jury. Her defense lawyer would argue that it had been an accident. But prosecutor Ross Edgar presented the case of a mother who had no love for her firstborn son, that she didn't want to be burdened with his care. They would present evidence from a handwriting expert that Michael's signature on one of the insurance applications had been forged. He pointed to her name changes as a way she collected insurance money while avoiding suspicion. He told the jury that Judy was a phony who pretended to be a doctor, a psychologist, and a registered nurse, when in fact, she was none of those. Judy took the stand in her defense, her small dark eyes framed by short dark hair. Throughout the trial, she showed no emotion. She attempted to portray herself as a loving mother that would never harm her children, and claimed that she had purchased life insurance on Michael to provide for him in the future. The trial lasted 11 days. March 30th would have been Michael's 23rd birthday. Later that night, as the clock hands ticked just past midnight, the jury found Judy guilty. For the first time, she showed emotion as she shouted, You all have to live with the fact that you have convicted an innocent woman. Judy was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole for 25 years plus 15 years for grand theft and insurance fraud. James Goodyear's body was exhumed and tested for arsenic poisoning. Court records indicated that when the crypt was open, it admitted a visible cloud and a strange odor. His body was well intact, preserved by the arsenic. 
His autopsy revealed high levels of arsenic in his liver, kidneys, hair, and nails, and that his death was a result of chronic arsenic poisoning that had occurred over a period of time. Judy was charged with his murder. Former prosecutor Belvin Perry said she almost got away with it. It all started coming apart when she tried to kill her fiancé by blowing him up in a car. Bobby Morris's body was also exhumed, and traces of arsenic were found. However, no charges were laid for his murder. James Jr. had been held in jail while waiting for his trial, which began in August 1984. The prosecution presented that he would have received $75,000 his share of the $500,000 life insurance for his part in the crime. He was surprisingly found not guilty for the car bombing and free to go home, to a home that no longer existed. The house and cars were gone, sold, and used to pay for defense lawyers. A month later, Judy's trial began for the attempted murder of John. Although Judy's friend in Alabama told police officers that the dynamite had been stolen out of his truck a couple days before John's car blew up. Police had obtained phone records that showed calls between him and Judy in the days leading up to and including the day of the attempted murder. Judy was questioned about what she knew about paraphernalia and asked if she knew if a one and a half gram dosage could be fatal. She replied yes, she knew that because she had studied it. Her trial only lasted a few days, and Judy was found guilty and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Then, Judy went to trial for the murder of her first husband. It took 14 years to get justice for James. In November 1985, Judy was found guilty of poisoning him and sentenced to death. Judy would be the first woman executed in Florida in 150 years, and the first to die in the electric chair. The Miami Herald reported that for 13 years, she was woken up at 6 a.m. when the lights popped on. Next, the meal cart rattled down the bare cement hallway, and a tray was shoved through a slot in her cell door. Judy spent years appealing her conviction to no avail. On November 9, 1989, Florida's governor signed her death warrant. Within hours of her execution, she received a temporary stay. Seven months later, the governor signed her second death warrant. She had waited on death row for 4,000 days in an 8 by 10 cell. On March 30, 1998, Judy's final moments were quiet. Her 50-year-old body wilted in fear as two guards walked her in, her face sunken and bony, her head shaved and covered with gel. One of her pant legs was rolled up to her ankle. She was strapped in to the leather restraints on the electric chair, nicknamed Old Sparky. Forty-eight people had come to see Judy die. She closed her eyes, her hands clenched. Thirty-eight seconds later, Judy was dead. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Jasmine Friore and Ryan Jenkins. Both sought fame and fortune. She is a model, he as a reality star. When their relationship turned violent, she ended up dead, and Ryan, a wanted man. Find out how, after nine days on the run, he turned up dead in a small town, seedy motel. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Vaseline Studios, and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, 
Sleep with the lights on and don't play with strangers.